this book, I told Laura that there was a snafu and I had to go out snow. and grab Mute. the book. And um, I grabbed it and she's like, well, I'm sure you haven't gotten through it. So I, you know, I'll help you. I was like, no, no, I've got 20 pages left. It's <laughs> that good in like a day and a half. I just, you know, between like doing stories, I, I, I got through this book almost to the end. Um, so it is a very well written, uh, very engaging, very human uh, book. One that when you see that, you know, a, a lawyer, sorry, lawyers everywhere, but you see a lawyer wrote a book, you think, okay, is this going to be like a lot of legal jargon? It is, um, it is very accessible. It is very heartfelt. It is very human. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for writing such an excellent uh, piece here. Sarah, I can't thank you. And I, I'm thrilled that you're here because I think I speak for everyone who's a part of the programming. You are such an incredible journalist. And the fact that you're inside of a room right now is shocking the world <laughs> because we always see you on location. And there's a reason for that because we need you to be everywhere you go to give us the perspective and the voice and the wherewithal and the information. So I'm incredibly humbled that you took the time to read it and be here with me today. And you know, you're right. It's not the type of book I think people expected me to write. I think the thought was, and I understand the concern about lawyers. I mean, I'm here in Washington, DC and the joke is you throw a rock and you're gonna hit 50 lawyers and get sued by a hundred more in that short path that it travels. And people give lawyers and journalists, frankly, the bad rap. But I think the expectation was that I would write a book that was very much one you could find in a law school classroom, a textbook, very esoteric, one that would look at a Supreme Court case and then analyze it. And while I do have a passion for that, I really intentionally wanted this to be a narrative memoir that really talked about the experiences of justice in America and have these stories personify these very important issues. And when we talk about speaking truth to power, don't you wanna know what the truth is and what it really looks like when we have our so-called marching orders towards justice, Sarah? Well, what is it and how do you really define it? And what does it look like when you are within a system and battling so much? You talk about, you, know, you start this book off with, with a particular case that was um, very, very, very difficult for you to get through. You were a professional, you were doing the thing that you thought you were supposed to be doing. Um, I want to start though with the fact that you were in the Department of Justice, you were um, fighting for civil rights. What is it that made you leave that work and go on to the U.S. Attorney's Office to, to start doing trials um, that were criminal trials? Very different work. Very different work under the same umbrella. I actually started out in private practice in my hometown in Minnesota and then moved to New York and worked for a large firm here as well. And then I found my calling and I knew it was my calling to go into civil rights work. And I started in the civil rights division in the Department of Justice and fighting for voting rights, which frankly, I actually written as part of my senior thesis in college at Princeton about the idea of what I felt about felon disenfranchisement and voting rights and how I thought it was the vestige really of a, a reconstruction era and an attempt to marginalize and dilute voting strength. That was not the biggest hit during my interviews at Justice, I will tell you, talk, talking about those very notions. <laughs> but when I had a chance to go, it was never in question that you were a champion on the right side, the good side, mm. so to speak, right? I know the word right is taken different ways these days, but you were on the side of justice. You were on the side of the community. It was a foregone conclusion that you were going to be their champion. And what a transformation. When I left, because I was frustrated from the bureaucracy, um, the idea of the, you can imagine in a voting rights section, the amount of chefs in the kitchen, whether it be politicians, like mm -hmm. officials, state and local leaders, those who were policy lobbyists who really had a stake and wanted it to be felt in the work you did and try as we might and, and successfully to try to compartmentalize and weed out those distractions, there was still the bureaucratic sort of Damocles that impacted what you were able to truly do. And it should be no surprise that was happening even back then when you still had the force of section five, when you still had the preclearance requirement, when you still had um, a non anemic section two of the Voting Rights Act, it was difficult work then. Mm -hmm. You can imagine where we are now with the two Supreme Court decisions that have rendered this seminal legislative act 
virtually anemic and clawing back of voting rights at the state level. It was hard then and bureaucratic then. And so I transitioned over to become um, a criminal prosecutor wanting to make a more tangible impact I felt on the community. And although I was under the same umbrella, Sarah, I was no longer presumed to be a champion of a community that was marginalized, let alone my own community. It was a foregone conclusion now that I was them or against them in the us versus them world. And it was jarring for me, not that I expected a parade um, or that I thought that I was entitled to praise and reverence, but it was jarring nonetheless to be confronted with this notion of what does it mean when the man looks like a black woman, is a black woman, has the lived experience of a black woman. You talk about what that means and what it meant to you. And for everyone, it's a different experience, of course. Yes. Um, can, can you give me an example of what started your disillusionment um, with working as a prosecutor uh, in criminal trials? You tell this heart-wrenching story of a victim who suddenly uh, turned into a perpetrator, if you will, someone who had broken the law that you discovered. Can you describe what happened and what started that sort of feeling of you know, I was trying to change things from the inside out, and I don't think that that's what's happening here. You know, I write about how the pursuit of justice can create injustice, and that might seem very counterintuitive. Um, I think working in the Justice Department makes you and forces you to confront the reality of what the system truly is, whether it's a legal system or a justice system. And there is a distinction between the two. <laughs> And I write about not only the first day in trial, in a trial courtroom, managing cases, looking at a parade of black and brown men and women who seemed to have, although we knew it was not true, just by the docket alone, seemed to have a monopoly on crime in Washington, DC. And so you had police officers who were also black and brown. So it wasn't a matter of the stereotypical notion of a white officer being oppressive towards particular communities of color. The, the color blue seemed to trump all else. And I thought about what it was like to have this influx, this re rehearsed routine, it seemed, where people knew a confined role within the justice system. And I questioned it even then about what I had gotten myself into and what I should be doing to try to balance, not infiltrate as a Trojan horse, but balance and pursue justice. And this story you write about, which is one of the first chapters in the book, you know, if you watch me on TV, you know I don't suffer any fools when it comes to um, being quite forthright and candid about how the law works and how it's supposed to work. And but I don't excuse myself from that level of magnifying glass. And I talk about this battle of allegiance. When I was asked to aid in the deportation, his crime was that he had come to the country illegally in his teenage years. He remained in the country for decades, was a law-abiding, upstanding, contributing member to the community, had raised his family, had not such as sneezed in an officer's direction. And what happened? His car was stolen by somebody who was virtually a career criminal. And in doing a background check, which we have to do for anyone coming into the courtroom to alert a marshal, there's an active warrant of any kind, a ministerial role, almost one that's just so you know ingrained that, okay, I'll run my little checks and I'll go to my trial. It pinged that he had this deportation warrant. And Sarah, it was one of those moments when I had to really look within and fight against the, the orders of our office and my moral compass, which said, this is an injustice to have this man deported because he is doing a service to the community by reporting a crime, knowing what the exploitation is like for people who are in the so-called shadows. You can imagine domestic violence and exploitation and now I can't even bother to call it a minimum wage with what's happening to many employers who know how to exploit those who are in the shadows. And, and what it was like to be instructed that here is what the law says, figure out a way to suck it up, take it on the chin and do what you're told. I didn't know how I would react in that moment. Somebody who I always thought would commit those acts of civil disobedience as easily as I would respirate to be confronted with the choice of 
Are you willing to be disbarred for helping this man or will you follow the orders? You are said, you, are you willing to be disbarred? I think it broke up a little bit. Oh, yeah. I was, yeah. So said, are you willing are to you, be disbarred? You ask yourself, are you willing? Yeah. Or follow the orders. And, and in the end, um, you know, you ended up having to follow those orders and, and thinking about this and you talk about just the emotional toll that took on you. I want to go back to something that you said, because I've heard this many times um, over the years from prosecutors uh, and uh, defense attorneys. And th th the saying is, this is a legal system that we have in the United States, not a justice system. What do you mean by that? You know, I think we often um, look at justice as if it's a destination, Sarah, that it's constrained by our views about trials. And you can blame sort of a law and order, LA law, Perry Mason generations over the years, looking at you know, this thought of, okay, well, here's how it's supposed to work. A crime is committed and within 48 minutes, you've watched the crime, you've, you have um, gotten your suspect, you've got the charges, a full trial happens, a conviction happens, and then there's time to chat over a coffee and walk down those proverbial steps out of the courthouse all with commercial breaks and you can get up and do your thing and have your little snacks to nosh on. In reality, justice is a much longer protracted process and it is not something that is defined by simply one verdict, one case, one headline. And oftentimes the pursuit of that, thinking about it as a destination, allows people to misunderstand what the focus and goals are. And so I talk about it as a legal system because how often have we heard the phrase, we're a nation of laws, right? We are a nation of laws and no one is above them. And we can all sort of have our side eye and pause as we reflect on what that really means in reality of practice. But it's the idea of when we think about the laws, we think about it in a very black and white issue. I don't mean race, I mean a black and white binary choice of either conviction or acquittal. Mm -hmm. And there's so much nuance and gray area that what's written on paper can never explain. And it's much like we think about the United States of America. You know, we are a constitution based society, but who we are on paper versus who we are in practice can be very different things. And the law is similar. Here are the book, here are the, the laws on the code books and the code books. Here's what justice looks like. And that, that chasm is what I explore in the book. And, and it's what we have to do as part of our national conversation to know what that gap looks like, why it's there, and how do we fill it. You talk about the perspective that you have. Um, here you are a, a prosecutor. Uh, you've also, you know, worked in, um, you know, a, a, a different form of, of law, but you go into this uh, arena uh, where there are a lot of black and brown people, uh, a parade, as you put it, of black and brown folks in comparison to the number of white folks that you saw. And here you are, a black woman um, with young children. Um, you're raising your young children as well. Can you give me an example of how you balanced that and how difficult that was? Because a lot of people find themselves, whether you're black, brown, woman, male, you find yourselves in a role where maybe you, you, are, you feel like you're representing a group, but you're also representing another group and you're torn. How yeah. did you balance all of that? You know, I can't um, you know, pat myself on the back and pretend I always did it well. And I still struggle with how to balance it, how to, on the one hand, have the conversation with the country about issues of importance and still have the talk with my children, having to balance the way in which you present and convey versus you know, um, comfort and rear. And that's constantly a battle that I am trying to, you know, a needle I'm trying to thread. But I, I really, I tell you, I wrote this book from a time I have back to back, I call them stair step babies, right? We have another 18 months apart. I'm not sure to this day what I was thinking, but I think it's because we didn't have distance learning at the time, Sarah. So the idea of having kids at home with you all the time was like wonderful to consider. And I still mm -hmm. love my babies, but whoo, teachers out there, I appreciate you. Yeah. Um, but at the time, you know, I was, I read the book in, in the time of when I was actually carrying my children in some part, I had newborns in some instances. And so it was what I was 
carrying while I was carrying. And I wanted to explain to my children what this world looked like and what role their mother played in it. Sometimes complicit, sometimes the champion and, and what that looks like and what we are doing. But this battle of allegiance, you're right, resonates for so many reasons. When, you, when your moral compass points one direction and what's expected of you points in a different one. When you are asked to shed facets of your identity at the door, but your instinct tells you to bring it in, bring all of that with you and do it unapologetically. And, and how do you grapple with it? And I have just found, Sarah, that 10 times out of 10, I am better in whatever I'm doing if I do not succumb to this idea of being a talking head, but instead being a human being with all the different facets, whether they're in competition or not, bringing myself with me along. And sometimes that's, that forces you to ask the questions that challenge the system. Other times it asks you to challenge who you thought you were. But I think mm -hmm. in any career, in anything you're doing, if you're being asked to shed your skin, whether it's your religion, whether it's your sexual orientation, whether it's your motherhood, your fatherhood, whether it's your race, whether it's any aspect of your identity, then challenge it and ask, what, what would it mean if I brought it in? What is it you're afraid will happen? Will it bring balance? Will it bring objectivity? Will it bring compassion? Will it bring a type of justice if I enter with my whole self? And that's what I think we have to do. Can you describe to me, I think that that really summed up what a lot of people struggle with. It doesn't matter your, your race, color, creed, um, socioeconomic, we, we all have that duality, I think, in our lives and in our work lives, especially. Um, can you describe to me, because you are, you were in the inside, right, uh, in a place where a lot of people are not familiar. What was it like? Was there racial bias? And ultimately, do you feel like the justice system or the legal system, um, as you had referred to it, is broken? You know, there were so many moments and I questioned and I, and to this day, the time I think to myself, is it better to be within the system, changing it from within or a spectator commenting about it? Um, is it better to have the reins or remove the muzzle? Um, and for me, I have reconciled it that the best position for me to be in is to be speaking the truth and using education and information as a form of advocacy not preventing it, not providing an agenda, but the truth as agency, the truth as activism. And, um, you know, I think when I reflect on my time in the Justice Department, there were moments when I really questioned myself, Sarah. I really questioned who I thought I was. There were moments of looking in the mirror and wondering where I had gone and challenging who I thought I was. And um, really being humbled. And I, I, I don't think I was an arrogant person. I think that there was a level of optimistic naivete about how things worked in practice. And it led me to believe that the narrow definitions of justice was what would rule the day, as opposed to thinking about it holistically and thinking about what role we should all play in it. And for me, I, I was challenged to write in the book about conversations I had with defense counsel who would look at me um, as black women themselves and black men, black and brown and say, how in the world can you profess to be civil rights oriented, Laura Coates? Mm. How dare you talk about being a civil rights attorney? And there you are where the quote unquote man is supposed to be. Why would you not use your power for good being on the defense side? Mm -hmm. And we would have these conversations and it was sometimes no holds barred. I write about it in the book. Sometimes it was a Martins with your enemy sort of conversation, but at all times it was the two sides, so to speak, questioning what role we should be playing in the justice system. And when you think about it, because of the parade of at times human misery, you would see there's this thought, this fallacy that black and brown people can perform but, and play but one role in the justice system as defendant and would you rather be in the reactive position or the proactive position? Would you rather be the one to dictate the terms or the ones to fight against them? And it was really an exploration for me and throughout my career of 
what does it really mean, Sarah, to have a seat at the table if you're still on the menu? Is it enough to be in the room where it happens? Shout out to Lin-Manuel Miranda, hashtag Aaron Burr <laughs> for my Broadway crowd with still stuck in my head. Is it enough to be in the room where it happens? Or is it that you are more than, the, more than just a presence? You are a force. And I think that thing I continue to, to grapple with in terms of what choices we make to be the force and how we wield it. Generally, prosecutors do have some discretion, sometimes a lot of discretion, depending on the office that they're in and their, and their hierarchy, um, and sometimes a little, but definitely discretion to make decisions on charging, et cetera. I do want to ask you about prosecution, because what you are describing is one community looking at you a certain way, the Black community expecting certain things from you, which you at the time were, were, were not in their eyes doing. And you've got another community of victims, of people who um, have been victimized uh, by someone who is uh, you know, a suspect or a perpetrator uh, in this case. I mean, do you think there is a place in our society for the way that we have our system set up and for prosecutors, some of whom very much feel like they're on the side of angels because they're on the side of those who have been victimized trying to give them uh, some solace or some justice, if you will, in a case. You know, that is something that is always in my mind and our minds as prosecutors, right? There is the idea of the introspective, woe is me. And this book does not talk about and, or try to lament or have the focus be on my personal feelings um, of being victimized by a system. It really talks about what it's like to be a part of that system and sometimes contributing. But the focus, of course, we talk about the, the sometimes confrontation with the community. Remember, the victims were also black and brown. And so it was always a curious mm. notion to me that I would be challenged about seemingly being complicit in the oppression of people that I believed and had the evidence to prove were guilty when they were victimizing people within that same community. And this odd prioritization that was happening about you know, a demonstration of your allegiance didn't come from advocating on behalf of the victims. That was always an odd conundrum for me. And it was one in which um, I think it's lost in the conversation. It's why I write about in perspective of what it was like for the people who are most impacted by the justice system. And it's interesting because when I stood up there, I would say Laura Coates on behalf of the people of the United States. And that necessarily included the defendant. It necessarily included the person who was victimized. It included the sort of victimless crimes of drug offenses that we also include in that as well. But you know who it doesn't include, unlike my private practice world, does not include a particular specific client, which I am advocating wholly on behalf of. And mm -hmm. it surprises people to know that if a victim wants to go forward or not, that idea, that television drama moment of, I wanna press charges or I want you to drop the case, that's for television. If I have the evidence to go forward, whether you like it or not, mm -hmm. we go forward. Whether you're cooperative, that's helpful to me, but it's not a requirement if I have corroborating evidence in other respects. And the reason for that is because we're not concerned solely on the particular person victimized, but that the remaining people of the United States don't want to be victimized. And so the ability to provide that cure and to be able to provide that, um, that accountability on behalf of a future hypothetical victim. And that's something I think that it's lost oftentimes in the decisions that are made as prosecutors because the discretion you talk about comes into play. Do you have the discretion to be able to advocate on behalf of society, even if at times it comes at the expense of the individual victim or perceived expense? But I think it's at the end of the day, it is extraordinarily important to have people who are bringing their whole selves, who have lived experience, who are thinking about justice, not only through the lens of sociology and politics and the economy, and of course, in terms of what's right and wrong, which is a Rorschach test more and more these days, but also thinking about it strategically. There's an advantage to bringing one's whole self because your jury is comprised of human beings as well who are thinking about this person, the victim, the defendants, you as the prosecutor, the judge, the defense counsel as human beings and wondering, can I see myself in that victim? Can I see myself in that defendant or that witness? We've voidir with the expectation of people 
having that mirror image and thinking about what their philosophies might be. And so it not only is the right thing to do to think about it holistically, it's advantageous for a prosecutor to think about a holistic approach and discretion in the same realm. You certainly don't give yourself a break, if you will, in this book. I mean, you talk about the struggles and the times when you felt like you did right and the times when you felt like you failed uh, at doing what, who you really were. And you ask yourself, who do I think I am? And there's one part in this book, or there's, <laughs> there's a lot of parts in this book, but there's one, the very sort of beginning chapters. You describe a scenario where power politics, if you will, are, are, are meted out on a 20-something defendant. Um, and you talk about a colleague of yours who appeared to think of his role as a prosecutor um, as using it as a game to mess with people. Can you tell us a little bit about that story and how that deeply impacted you? Because you write about it and uh, it, you know, it happened a while ago, but you write about it in, 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 very detailed way, in a very detailed way. And it really struck me how much you sitting there watching this play out on someone who looked like you and who was very young um, and, and you just, you felt um, almost powerless to, to try and do something about it. Yeah. You know, feeling powerless is perhaps not a new emotion for a black woman in America, but feeling powerless at times when you are supposed to be at the helm of power, now that's a horse of a different color. And the example you talk about is one day, it's a chapter called, you wanna see something funny. And in a moment when I was preparing for trials involving other violent crimes, and you know, we at the US Attorney's Office talk about trial by fire and drinking out of the fire hose. You think the news cycle is at a fast neck break pace. Welcome to the onslaught of cases that come that pile up on your table and the expectation of perfection, but never having the time to be. And I take that seriously and, and obviously think about the context in which I um, understood and experienced my colleagues' experiences as well. And in my you know, pre preparation one day for all these different trials and I was inheriting cases and someone was moving on, um, a white male colleague appeared at my doorstep and leaned in and said he'd provide this sort of moment of levity or reprieve. And I, like so many people, needed that sort of coffee break moment. Perhaps there was a moment to have levity in the otherwise, you know, mundacity of what's going on and the mundane nature of everything. And so I sort of blindly followed because he had wanted to take me under his wing and mentorship can be few and far between in a business like we have now, Sarah, and of course, in other respects. And I went along and thought, oh, what, what are we going to see here? Little did I know that we we're going to go to the basement of our office building and we would find a young man and he didn't look really to me a day over 16, although he was, chained to a chair uh, with his attorney who was typing away on his phone and listening and sort of pointing out one thing like, hold on, I'll, I'll advocate in a second. You guys go ahead and talk amongst yourselves moment. And, um, and instantly realizing in this moment that I was looking upon a human being and that was the punchline. That was, that was the see something funny. That was the idea, let me show you how it's done, Coates, to try to teach me the ways of putting a notch on one's belt to show you what power can look like and how you can wield it to get what you want. And it was a lesson that he was trying to give I think perhaps inadvertently in this notion of the ends justifying the means to try to get someone to be a cooperator and an informant. And it was for me that immediate moment of realizing that I'd always perhaps thought in whatever battle of us versus them, I was on David's side. But in that moment, I was not. I was assumed to be in the us and in a position of power to wield against somebody who had no power in the situation. And I, it, it made me not only angry, and I spoke about it and write about it in the book and what that felt like, and the juxtaposition of this young man's humanity towards me compared to the inhumanity of somebody who was supposed to be a public servant, which includes the public that he is in, it made me reflect on what, it, what, what was it about me, Sarah? that you thought that I stro strive to emulate you. But what, 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 what was I doing in that moment? What was I doing wrong 
that you thought, here is someone I can train. Here is someone that will be like me and want to act in this way. And, and in that moment, I realized that perhaps even when you don't intend to be, or you have your own preconceived notions that some, sometimes you are inadvertently complicit. And it was an eye-opening experience for me that really carried with over with me and everything else I did to try to wonder, are I complicit or am I an advocate? Am I acquiescing or am I standing up for what's right and making myself cognizant of having a choice in all matters? And if I didn't wield it appropriately, then I was no better than the people that, that exploited power and people that I think should not be public servants. Can I ask you how hard it is or was to stand up for what is right, whether you're an advocate for the victim or whether you're also an advocate for the truth and for the person who is accused in the case, knowing to do things in a very uh, fair way? How difficult was that? And is it possible um, in, in something like the Justice Department when you are a prosecutor and expected uh, to prosecute the fullest extent of the law? It is, it is challenging um, to grapple with that, but I, I make no bones about the fact that I understood that I, I wasn't assigned to be a prosecutor. Right. It wasn't like the Hunger Games when I had to, I was a tribute all of a sudden. I, mm -hmm. I had a say and I had agency enough to have, to have desired. And I was that person, frankly, who sort of threw my name in the hat of the USA Jobs website, which is notorious for needle in the haystack. I, I had this choice, chance to do so. And I didn't know anyone in justice. I didn't know anyone. Um, I, you know, I'm a little bit scrappy, Sarah. I fought like hell to be there and I certainly earned the opportunity to do it, which means I asked for the opportunity. So because I'd asked for it, when you ask to lead in that way, you're responsible for the permission that's granted to you. And um, I knew that I needed to advocate for the people who were victimized. I know the directives, I know and there are moral conundrums and quandaries that I certainly faced, but I knew that as much as I was grappling with something, somebody had been wronged, somebody had been harmed. It's much easier to do the work when you're talking about a victim of, um, who clearly victimized a sexual assault or somebody who was a victim of a violent crime. Those were not the moments when I, I, I thought I might buckle. Those were the cases that were quite clear to me. But there's also the cases where you have to become the advocate for the person charged, not because you're leaving your role as a prosecutor, but because you have a responsibility to uphold the constitution. And when you see their rights being violated, when you see a defense counsel falling asleep at the wheel, you've got to do more, not only selfishly because you want to preserve a conviction on appeal and because you know that if you don't speak up, um, you know that it'll be held against you with the credibility of the judge, You'll be viewed differently by your colleagues. You're not doing the right thing, but also because of humanity. The idea of, look, it's, you don't ever wanna be a part of the justice system in terms of a defendant. The amount of weight that's against you when you have the United States versus and your name is at the other end. We talk about social media, you never wanna be a hashtag. You never also want to be the name on the other side of that V because of all the benefits of doubt that are extended to the people who are trying to, pro to prosecute you. The benefit of the doubt given to a police officer where we know, we don't think an officer gets up in the morning with the intention to, um, to you know, frame somebody, let alone harm them. We don't think that the government, you've heard, you said, you said yourself I'm short different times in your life, you know, well, they wouldn't have prosecuted him if they didn't think he did something, didn't have the evidence, benefit of the doubt. When judges give the benefit of the doubt to you as the government and the weight of that, the question really is you have responsibility to preserve that credibility and maintain the right to have that benefit of the doubt. But be prepared when your colleagues fail, or at times perhaps you fail, that it will be held against you as well in a court of law and the government, which is why you see, you know, 
criticism right now about what the Justice Department does and the, um, the amount of time it takes them to contemplate whether to bring charges in some instances and the concern that they're contemplative to the point of being par um, paralyzed, it's because they're also thinking of the fact that we're all fungible, right? If I was giving birth one day, the trial still went on. It was still a matter of, look, well, thank you, government. Where is the next person in the government in your shoes? And the things that you do correctly inured the benefit of the next person and the next person and the next person to the point where you become almost untouchable if it's preserved collectively. And the person on the other side doesn't have the same fighting chance. And so it's really about how you wield that power and how those benefits of the doubt are given. And I even write about it in terms of the judges. We, we, we assume, right? There's a, whole, there's a chapter about what we assume in terms of mm -hmm. um, judges being impartial and judges, there's more than one criticism about judges, frankly, in the book um, and the expectation that they will be impartial fact finders and um, above antics and not bring within them, bring the bias into the courtroom. And that black robe suddenly will shield them from even the temptation of doing that. But then we know and we see in the real world what it's like. They're human beings who are bringing with them whatever they are comp comprised of. You know, we joke around about the Supreme Court of the United States, and we've all heard that familiar script about when they're asked for confirmation hearings, how they feel about something. Suddenly there's an amnesia cap that's put on. It says, mm -hmm. you know, I really, um, did I write about that? Did I have 50? 50 op-eds about it, I don't really recall. And you know what, I can't talk about it because it might one day come before me. Well, that sort of air of what it takes to be on the bench to convince of impartiality of the prospect, if we criticize it in the real world as we're looking at it, it happens at the lower levels in the court, just it goes unnoticed. And the impacts, unlike the Supreme Court, are far more severe and felt more readily by members of the community. I do want to ask you about that because you brought something up. You brought so many things up, and I want to go back to talk to you about. Because I'm long-winded, um, Sarah. It's so, it's so good. You've got so much information. It's so good. I've got shy. Um, you've got, you, and you've got a lot of caffeine. I love it, girl. Um, so you you talked about a lot of things, and I want to go back to a story you tell about a judge, which was frankly shocking, if I may. Um, but I want to talk to you about the politics of things because you you alluded to it. Um, that you know, you see that black robe, and you assume that of everybody in the courtroom, that that is the person that is standing over, looking over things, and is impartial, and that can really just kind of lean back and listen, and they're not trying to prove a point. Um, and we also expect that from our Supreme Court as well, that they are actually going to take everything into account, not none of their biases. But isn't it political? I mean, we say, oh, they're not supposed to be political, but isn't isn't a judgeship? I mean, they were once, usually they were once attorneys too, whether they were defense attorneys or they were prosecutors or they were, you know, in some other capacity in private practice, they too uh, come from a place of, of humanity and of, of opinion. Um, can we still say, oh, well, the Supreme Court is not supposed to be political? Isn't it intrinsically political? You know, it's a fascinating con uh, conversation to have about it because certainly the Supreme Court would like you to believe they are apolitical and they will put it on the media and um, experts and commentators who are the ones who refer to them as the conservative right. justices or the liberal justices. And they will say they are a Supreme Court justice, they're a chief, they're an associate, whatever they might be in their ranking. And so they will sort of throw that back in a boomerang notion of the I'm rubber, you're glue motion here, right? But in reality, of course, the process by which we choose our Supreme Court justices is inherently political. They are political, not appointees that serve at the pleasure of the president, like an attorney general or a head of an agency, but they are chosen from a short list that's given to them by different lobbyists, special interest groups who are telling them, here are the people who you need to nominate and here's how they might you know, fare in terms of voting. And so they're nominated by a president of the United States. And we have seen, of course, that that, prospect, that process in, in and of itself is political. Now, we did not expect it to be political in the confirmation hearing to the degree that it was under Senator Mitch McConnell on the idea of withholding the opportunity for the dignity of even an interview and meetings. I mean, I just want people to focus on what that indignity must have felt like for a 
of an appellate judge like now General Garland to be sitting in a hallway waiting to be received by members of another branch and yet co-equal branch of government to be denied because you could. I mean, that showed you that there was a political, if you didn't believe before, there was a political role that was being played. Obviously their job is to advise and consent as senators, but not to withhold and undermine. And I think that is the, the part that people were so frustrated with, not to mention the idea of what you see when it comes time for voting and casting your vote in favor of confirming or not, those conversations can be inherently political. But the most um, blaring example, I think in my mind of how you look at this is, we should not be having presidential campaigns turning and contingent on a particular Supreme Court precedent that the campaign itself can be, I'm going to have somebody who will do this specific thing. That's antithetical really. And an ethic to, an ethic to the idea of what we look at as an objective impartiality that it almost feels like a very long puppet string from the Oval Office to the Supreme Court. Now the Supreme Court does not do itself any favors when um, frankly, when they are given opportunities to ensure that the gravitas and the sanctity of good precedent is withheld, they have allowed in recent months in Texas an end run around precedent. I mean, I didn't think I'd see the day. I understand that you, could, you may have um, qualms with the way in which a case is decided and maybe have your personal viewpoints on it. But the idea that somebody could create an end run around Roe v. Wade in Texas by removing the opportunity for judicial review removing an opportunity for a check and balance on another branch of government and for that to go unchecked, I would have thought that there would be at least the idea in the us versus them conversation, Sarah, of uh, how dare you have the audacity to think we mean nothing. And the reason I think that's so striking is because the only reason we respect the Supreme Court in some respects, not the individual justices, each has a resume that to be reckoned with. Each is a great and incredible legal mind, even if you don't agree with him or her. But you run the risk of delegitimizing yourself, knowing the only reason people continue to honor it is because of political inertia. That's the way it's always been. That precedent is to be followed. That when the nine justices say something, it actually means something and people mm -hmm. quiver at the thought of rejecting it. Well, if you don't nip that in the bud, you run the risk of delegitimizing that authority. And then what slippery slope do you find yourself in? It's similar to what you see in Congress right now. If you have members of Congress who are interested in um, trying to convince the public that otherwise, you know, um, duly created commissions and committees somehow are illegitimate in the legislative or oversight function, you cut off your nose to spite your face and risk delegitimizing yourself in the future. Our own elections, Sarah, if you convince the people in a Kaiser so say, usual suspects or in a way that never existed, you can tell I love movies, right? If you think about it that way, if you risk people saying, we don't have fair and free elections, well, then they don't believe in the integrity of our elections. And then it is a disincentive to participate. And I'm just always struck at the way politics contributes to that delegitimizing of otherwise revered institutions. And they could do a better job of demonstrating they are not in fact political. And I will go to talk about um, the judge who you, and there, there are, there's more than one, but one particular story about a judge that uh, plays into this idea of delegitimizing um, their stance even in the courtroom and in society was a, a, a really disturbing case, a teenage girl who um, had been raped. And you talk about what the judge was doing in court. Can you tell us that story and the impact that had on you and, and others in that court? You know, that story, that chapter is called No One Who Has Been Raped Would Ever. And it's sort of that um, beginning preface that we hear in victim blaming and shaming. We've heard for decades, frankly whether it's how a woman dressed or whether somebody, and I hate to even recall and remind people of phrases like she asked for it. Mm. Um, but yet it's really very much still a, a part of the fabric of how we 
view who is entitled to be called a victim, who is entitled to be treated with dignity. And in a world like the Me Too era we live in now, where the overarching mantra is believe women in the court of public opinion and the right to be heard without preconceived notions. In the court of law, it often works very differently. And the thought is that, particularly when it comes to women, that we will give a benefit of the doubt, that we will provide some level of objectivity by virtue of a kindred spirit or shared experience in the world. And this young girl was um, a victim in a trial where her stepfather, for all intents and purposes, had been accused of raping her over a number of years. Her own mother um, was aware of it, was in the courtroom, but on the side of the man. And in her own right, was victimized for reasons I explain in the book as well. And I'll never forget, I was in the courtroom for a different matter. It wasn't even my trial. And I tell stories like this. Each story is episodic and really stands alone and can be read you know, at any time, not just as one theme throughout the whole book. And I write about how in this instance, it wasn't my trial, but I was watching it. And I watched as this young girl came bouncing down the aisle in her youth and the immediate judgment about from this woman judge but in the instant I saw her look at this young girl, I knew my colleagues had lost the trial. I knew they had lost the case. You could see the judgment on this judge. And it's interesting because, you know, we oftentimes in a delayed sexual reporting case, think about a Bill Cosby case as being a prime example of delayed reporting or what you've recently seen in New York of the Ghislaine Maxwell trial. You can go on mm. with different examples. We oftentimes assume that a jury will come with bias and preconceived notions and will not understand the reasons for delayed reporting, will judge in the way that we've seen people judge. And we often look to judges to be the ones to say, okay, you'll, you'll sort of silence all that. You'll block all that ridiculous mm -hmm. bias out. But this judge not only instantly fed into it, but during the trial was so dismissive of the testimony that when I approached the bench on another matter, I found that she was actually shopping for shoes. While this young girl was crying her eyes out in this extraordinarily difficult moment in search of a champion, telling what had been happening to her over the course of years, alienated and rejected from her family by her own mother, apparently a cognac boot with a um, that bit of wide calf was even more important to this judge. That's how much it was written off. And it is, to say it's frustrating and disheartening would be the understatement of the century. But I wanted to peel back the curtain and let people understand that when we're talking about bias in the justice system, we're not just talking about a police officer in an encounter on the street, we're not just talking about a voir dire and a juror, it's an ecosystem that must be addressed. And an ecosystem when it comes to race, when it comes to gender, when it comes to LGBTQ members, when it comes to victim blaming and shaming, we got to peel back the curtain, Sarah. What do you make of reforms? There have been a lot of um, different ideas out there, whether it is you know getting rid of cash bail, um, or there are prosecutors, for example, in the Los Angeles area where I am, uh, in Philadelphia as well, who have decided certain things would no longer be offenses that people would go to jail for, uh, turning some felonies into misdemeanors. Um, the, the, you know, one side of this, and and I've talked to a lot of different people that are that have been involved in some of this. One side of this says, hey. Crime is skyrocketing in some of these cities. The, the, part of this problem is that people are in a revolving door. They're going into to the courts and then they're coming out, even if it's a violent crime, and they're just let out back onto the streets. And so their argument is it's not working. Um, but what do you make of some of the reforms that we have seen that I know you're well aware of? You know, it's fascinating because this is a debate happening, I said, in Philadelphia and Baltimore, all across this country, really, about the idea of in part because of COVID and the limitations on resources, the idea of deciding which cases you're going to prosecute and which not, and the idea of thinking about in the limited you know, universe of resources and having to decide where to put your efforts and your man or woman power, deciding that nonviolent crimes are not the way to pursue. Prostitution, small amounts of drugs, a lot of things that, that comprise the bulk of the system and these notions, like I mentioned, these sort of like victimless crimes, as they say, 
Um, it has caused a lot of stir and controversy because on the one hand, for those who are advocating for it, Sarah, it's the idea of it makes the police officers um, have a more limited presence, which means that the neighborhoods that are often marginalized for other reasons, the same ones that oftentimes coincide with dilution of voting strength, but they're not being policed with almost always a military presence where people are looking for things or the idea of the broken windows philosophy is carrying on. Um, so that's a good thing for those who advocate, but it's also, and it makes some officers, they say makes them feel more safe that they're not always having to go and patrol for, for more minor crimes. They can focus on their other work. On the flip side though, you have the idea of criminals being emboldened to commit offenses because they'll go unchecked. I mean, you want to make someone feel emboldened to keep doing it. You don't hold them accountable in the instance of what they have done. And these crimes do impact people's feelings of safety in their communities. Um, it, it impacts the businesses that want to be in those communities who want to protect their own economic assets. It, in talking about a child walking to school, it, it has an impact on all sorts of things. The culture can be transformed. And officers say that they feel less safe because if you're not gonna prosecute, say, arresting arrest-related crimes, well, that means that people are gonna be emboldened in that way. And so when I think about the, the motivation for why these decisions are being made, um, you know, I evaluate it from the perspective of what are the costs and benefits of doing it this way? But ultimately it speaks to a, a bigger issue, Sarah, and that is how do you, restore, if not create trust for the first time mm. between law enforcement and communities that have been marginalized, because that's really what they're talking about fundamentally. The idea of, you, do you, are you our champion or not? Do you have our best interests? Are you looking for, you know, sort of a holiday bonus, the number of arrests you have right now? The decisions about, say, a speed camera, you've probably driven through areas um, where you're like, I drive through suburbia all the time. I don't see a speed camera. I drive down one stretch in Southeast Washington, DC, which, you know, we're a quadrant out there, people. And so talking about a stone throw from the Capitol and suddenly there's 50 speed cameras on the way. And if you, you know, you're, you're stopped every 10 seconds trying to collect revenue. And if you don't pay that, you lose licenses. If you don't do that, you can't, I mean, what are the choices being made? And so I do think that there is a lot to be said about prioritizing those crimes that are most impactful and not using communities as a pretextual reason for revenue generation. I wanna ask you a question from the audience. Um, we had someone ask the question about um, civil rights and going after, you know, murder is, you know, against the law locally, statewide and federally. Um, but in the case, for example, of, of George Floyd and the, and the death of George Floyd at the hands of uh, then officer Derek Chauvin. The question is, why do the federal agencies have to go after and try to prove a civil rights violation instead of being able to prosecute um, on, on different terms? Because it is sometimes very difficult to prove a civil rights violation in, in some cases. It's true. And frankly, it comes down to the idea that we invest in our states and local jurisdiction with the ability to prosecute murder charges. There are, of course, federal cases as well, and there are different requirements to get into a federal court. Sometimes in the civil world, it's about the different parties being from different states called diversity jurisdiction. Other places, the amount in controversy that you have to get into a state or a, a federal court. Other times, it's the actual, whether there's a law on the books, a federal level law that actually speaks this very issue. And so we're talking about the civil rights cases versus the state level prosecution. There are different elements one must prove to be able to get to say a hate crime related charge. And that's intentional because on the state level, obviously you want to stop the homicides as a deterrent. You want it to have a punitive aspect of the conviction and you perhaps have rehabilitation as part of it. We are taught to that particular victim who's been harmed. Hate crimes are about trying to protect communities because unlike a specific victim, the horror of hate crimes is that anyone who is perceived to have the characteristic of whatever is offensive to that person could be targeted. I mean, there are people who are perceived as uh, because of their clothing, that they must be a particular religion. People who are perceived as being a member of the LGBTQ plus community. People who are perceived as being a ra one race or not. People who are perceived mm -hmm. as any number of factors and are targeted 
and have done nothing, obviously, to be in that scenario. George Floyd um, is, a, is one that's a specific homicide case, but hate crimes general. So we have different criteria and we do it because it's a crime against society more than what happened to the individual victim, because we could all at one point in time be susceptible. It's why you have the Matthew Shepard and, um, and Bird uh, legislation about the idea of why we have hate crimes legislation to punish further that we as a society decide you cannot target and, and wield your bigotry for violence. I have a last question here because I know we're starting to get close to time. And the last question is, what is it that you hope to say um, with this book? What are you trying to impart to the reader um, and to society at large? You know, I've, I've wrestled with why, why I wrote this. And I, at times, Sarah, I, I wondered if it was too personal. I'm, I'm somebody who talks about the law. I'm, you know, I at times am known for being quite stoic in my presentation. And I was, I was concerned about letting people in. Um, and feeling vulnerable and letting them see what justice can feel like and, and, and better understand me as a conduit of information and experience it vicariously. But in the end, I, I think of it as in New York, you know your signs, see something, mm -hmm. say something. You see it mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. And there is a great deal to be learned when we see something and we say something, no matter what the consequences might be, no matter how you yourself are judged or how you yourself are viewed, it's about showing the world what it really is and that America on paper versus what it could be is distinct. And I, I think about this when I look back in the civil rights era and I think about the choices of Emmett Till's mother to let the world see what injustice looked like on the face of her son, to have an open casket. I think about what it was like for freedom riders who came from the North after seeing what took place on the Edmund Pettus Bridge and saw the media's role in holding a camera and a lens and a light to what was really happening. I think about it through the, the cell phone camera of a young teenager walking her kid's sister to the store to get a snack and coming upon George Floyd and how that changed so much of what we thought and viewed and understood. And there's countless examples of this. And so I hope that the world and in each of those instances, it's transformative to be able to, through that vicarious experience and through that growing of empathy to understand the system of justice, to maybe not only pursue it, but one day catch it and really be the country that we envision ourselves to be and hold ourselves out to be. And I think stories like these, the stories of people's experiences, shed as much of a light on the justice system as any legal textbook about a Supreme Court opinion. In fact, it's in my world, storytelling is the, in times, the highest form of advocacy, and it is the predicate for any sustaining change. So I hope people will take it and they'll come with me on the journey. They'll see themselves in it. They'll to question their own choices, they will experience it with an eye towards reforming the system. And maybe as you come full circle, one day it will be not just a legal system, but the justice system in America. I don't know what else to ask you, but I do want to show the cover of your book since I have it here with me. Um, I'm what do you mean this book? Cheers! <laughs> there it is! Oh, we both had it! Yay! Yay. Uh, just Pursuits by Laura Coates, A Black Prosecutor's Fight for Fairness. It is an excellent read, um, worth every single cent. Thank you so much, Laura Coates. And thanks everyone for taking part in this and, and being able to be a part of a, a fascinating conversation from just to excuse my language, but a kick-ass, bad, badass woman. She's talking about herself because she's Sarah no, Sider, everybody. No. So let me tell you something. Much respect. <laughs> I bow down. You know, every day I'm like, how does she do it? <laughs> I feel the same about you. Keep well, doing what you. you're doing. And thank you to the um, 90 Second Sheet Y for having us today. I really do appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all. And I see the your lovely statements in the chats. And I really do appreciate all the, of you taking the time out tonight to be a part of it. So thank you.